Um, I'm Sven, as Marcus said, and today I want to just discuss the role of genetic diversity in biological control agents and the effects that genetic diversity can have on aspects of their biology. So, genetic diversity control agents are sometimes found to have quite low levels of genetic diversity and can be a result of a number of factors, uh, namely at the collection point in the native range, where they're often collected in small numbers and from a very few number of sites. Also, from population declines um, in mortality and transit, quarantine, mass rearing facilities, and also inbreeding um, from those same places. But uh, we often refer to this as a genetic bottleneck. And the problem with that is that while the genetic bottleneck will decrease diversity in control agents, and this is a number of results that can be beneficial or detrimental. Um, in their beneficial forms, they can purge alleles in from populations, which may decrease their may increase their efficacy. Um, in the detrimental form, they can decrease the fitness of the control agents. And in introduced populations, this would decrease their increase their susceptibility to changes in the environment. Um, so my study uh, wanted to investigate genetic diversity and its effects on life history within a biological control agent. And in order to do this, we used Frederica Guerini, the biological control agent on Peresky Aculeata, which Ian Patterson spoke about yesterday. It's currently the only control agent released currently. Um, the only agent released on Peresky. It's from South America. It's monophagous. It has three larval instars, and the females, uh, it's a female sex biased um, ratio, and the females are larger, which the, it also takes a bit longer for them to develop um, from, pupa from pupation to adult. We're very lucky in that there are two strains that we have. Uh, the original strain is the progeny of the original releases made in the early 1990s. Um, they were collected in small numbers from Brazil. They spent quite a lengthy period of time in quarantine and there were no subsequent releases made up until the next collection that was made for the mixed strain. Uh, it was a more recent collection from a variety of sites in Brazil, collected in quite large numbers. And this was crossbred with the original strain. So what we have is a strain with low levels of genetic diversity compared to the other strain which has a bit more. And we identified two areas of life history that would, um, which we'd be able to compare, that being the duration of development and the fecundity of the two strains. And we, we placed a number of larvae on two plants and we sampled each day to, by removing larvae from the plants, taking their weights, their length, and also the head capsule width um, from the larvae. Uh, we from about from day 20 up until they entered pupation, we were able to get individual weights and track them into pupation as well as out uh, when they are closed as adults. Um, in f for fecundity, we gained the sex ratio at eclosion, and we paired virgin males and females together, and were able to get um, data on the number of egg batches produced per female, the number of eggs in each batch, as well as the number of larvae that hatched. From there. And the results were actually quite astounding. Um, so here, yeah, the, the mixed population is the one with higher genetic diversity. And it reaches the second, third, second instar, the third instar, and it reaches interspupation sooner than the original population, which has less mm -hmm. genetic diversity. Um, we actually alluded to uh, protandrous um, eclosion earlier. And that is one reason that we can use to explain why the original population would reach eclosion sooner than the mixed population, as the mixed population actually has the female sex bias on there. All of these results also seem to be significant from one another. The weight of the, um, of the two populations, the original and the mixed strains entering pupation and at eclosion, is a quite a good indication of, uh, of fecundity and health within the population. So 
often we will take a, a pupil mass, but as Fenrika pupates in the soil, we couldn't do that without really killing the, the insect. So entering pupation and, and closing as adults, we were able to show that the mixed strain is heavier at both, in both instances when compared to the original strain. And these were also deemed to be significant from each other. In fecundity, we, the results of our tests uh, showed us that the mixed population with higher genetic diversity produces a lot more eggs. They produce more egg batches, more eggs per batch, as well as more larvae hatching from the eggs. And it was also deemed to be significant from one another. So in conclusion, we, we found that a more genetically diverse strain in uh, Fenrika has produced a faster duration of development. There were also heavier occupation and implosion. They had a higher percentage of their eggs hatch, and they produced more females. And this is great for biological control, because we sort of want these, these insects to expand once we release them into the environment. And all of these factors over here will, will influence that. So re the recommendations that we can take from this study is that, yes, genetics has a place and it does play a big part in the life history and the biology of the insect. And that, especially in the case of Brescia culiata, we should use the strain with more genetic diversity because it performs better than the original releases. So we should use the, the mixed strain um, for Prestia cubiata. Thank you very much. Any questions? Do you think that you could also influence host specificity? Um, it's, a, that's a, it's a question that often arises. Does will genetics affect the host specificity? But with monophagous insects, they've, they've evolved with, with their plant for such a long time that those types of genes often don't, uh, if there are mutations on those genes, it's probably deleterious to the population, so they would be, they wouldn't increase um, in, they wouldn't increase within the population at too much of a rapid rate, and they would probably um, die out to those individuals that had it. So I don't think that it would affect um, specificity directly, um, but you know, I think there's there's more studies that can that would be able to. I like that point a bit more. Especially since there weren't really any concerns about the specificity of the Rika origin. I think um, maybe they, that shows that it is really they are all the same. I'm sorry, I'm not quite the, the, the original way. strain that was tested for high specificity. Yes, did yes. Did have any uh, non-target effects? No, they weren't. They were. It was deemed to be strictly um, host specific in the original strain. And, um, you know, we just, little side projects, we have given the, the mixed strain other, other plants and they haven't eaten it at all, they've, they've died straight away, so. So, it's a very interesting stuff. Um, well, one thing that um, I might have missed it, but we really confused, is the replication at the strain level for um, so you were creating strains? No, no, these strains were created. Um, they were actually, they were bred up, they were bred together by Sassari, by Denise and uh, Des at Sassari. We, we got individuals from them, um, from mixed strain, and our original strain was from one of the established sites at Port Alfred. I'm, so, I'm just thinking, you, you know, when you get some conclusions on there, you might want to think about whether the replication should be at the strain level as opposed to whatever within the strain. But because one of the things you might expect if you have a vast number of low genetic diversity strains, there'd be much higher variability as well. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, 
A lot of the agents might not even come from a single female. I think Trikadio is possibly in this country, both of them from a single female, and probably near the Pagavis as well, and both of them as well. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. So the trade-off also to increase genetic diversity is by bringing in more material is disease potential as well. So yes, I mean um, one of the one of the um, sort of the solutions to maybe increasing genetic diversity has often been to think about multiple introductions and reproductions, um, but there there are some concerns that, um, as we've seen, genetics can affect the life history. Um, so it would be so, so case by case and make sure you've got your ducks in a row before you yeah. do it. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you very much, sir.